next part of what we're going to discuss today is crystal, uh, crystal oscillators. Now, many of the circuits, like when you do microprocessors and they like, many of them require a clock signal. Somebody early on um, in the class, way back some weeks ago, had been talking about clock signals, I believe, when we spoke about multivibrators and the like. So microprocessors and, and sequential logic devices, yeah, FPGAs and, and the like, almost all digital processing devices require some sort of clock to function. It times everything with respect to our clock signal. Those kind of signals now, you're, you're typically talking in the, in the low, low to high megahertz range and beyond. And to make those kind of oscillators, what we use or the, the established um, techniques in industry are to use what we call crystal oscillators. Now the crystal oscillators are based on quartz crystals. Quartz, of course, as the ingredient, um, one of the raw materials for plain ordinary glass. But the, the thing about it is that once you cut the crystal, the, 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 the crystal mechanism itself has some um, planes, if you like, the, the, the crystal structure, the lattice structure, which is something that I think when you, if you did um, like um, A-level chemistry and they talked about lattice structures and so on, that, that the, the, the atoms of the, the crystals or the molecules of the crystals are layered in particular ways. Quartz is no different. And what happens is that depending on, on how you cut the crystal, in other words, take slices of the crystal, the crystal behaves in a very strange way. In that if you stress this, um, the, the quartz crystal itself, meaning squeeze it, stresses pressure, force over area, so if you squeeze the crystal in a particular way, it has a resonant frequency depending on the amount of, of the mechanical stress that you put onto it. It is also um, something called piezoelectric, which means that if you um, also squeeze it, it generates electricity, a voltage. And if you supply a voltage to it, it vibrates. So it, 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 it's a sort of dual behavior. Mechanical flexing causes it to have a particular resonant frequency depending on how, how it is made. And then if you squeeze it, it generates a voltage. And if you put a voltage on it, it generates, it, it vibrates basically. Now we use that, this is just an aside. We use the P, that piezoelectric effect, the part where you supply a voltage and it deforms or it, or it, or it vibrates. We use that in, in, um, in loudspeakers, a particular type of speaker called a piezoelectric, uh, piezoelectric tweeter, right? It's a high frequency tweeter. And you also see this occurring in, in all sorts of noise makers and, and children's toys and alarm systems and the like. So it's not only here. And basically what it is, it's a wafer a small circular disk of silicon with some electrodes attached to it. And when you put the audio signal onto the electrodes, the wafer vibrates. And it vibrates um, because of its piezoelectric behavior and you get sound being produced. In our case, we use the fact that if you supply that voltage, that particular oscillation under certain conditions is extremely stable and very, um, very predictable. Here are some of the, and, and you're going to meet it, you, you inside of this, and these are the kind of packages that you're going to meet, like for instance, when you do microprocessor labs on, 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 on the like, you're going to see these little metal cans, like the top two images for you um, in there. One of them, the, 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 the top one on the left-hand side, or the top middle of the screen, if you like, this one, is a plain crystal, right? So this is a plain crystal inside of here. You have the two leads. And if you open it up, it is sort of structured like that. There's a disc of the, the crystal and then there's an, the electrodes attached to it. And you plug that into the circuit. Now you have to do certain things to get it to vibrate, of course. This particular one has 12.000, it's a 12 megahertz crystal. So when you do, when you apply a particular voltage to it, 
then it vibrates at 12 megahertz. The one on the right hand side, this one here, right, has the crystal, but it also has some additional circuitry inside of it. So it has the additional pin. So two of the pins are where the oscillator signal comes in, and then two pins are where we, uh, sorry, where the oscillator signal comes out, and two pins are where we supply VCC. And this is the more common one you're going to meet. This particular one requires you to do some extra stuff to make it work. But the one on the right hand side is the one that you will most likely be meeting when you get to do your microprocessor labs. All right? So how does this help us? Basically, because it is a um, piezoelectric device, it has electrical and mechanical properties. And we model it in two ways. Um, we model the mechanical properties on, on one side, the behavior, the, the electromechanical properties, which is you, you put a voltage and it vibrates. And we, we do that, it's a it's a RLC network that creates that sort of model for us. You remember yesterday we were talking about modeling systems? Well, it just so happens that the behavior can be modeled by an LRC series circuit. And then another part of the characteristic the, 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 the sort of electrical part of it, we model as a capacitance in parallel with all of that, right? So it is a series RLC circuit in parallel with a capacitor. So this is the electro, the electrical model or the circuit for how the quartz crystal behaves, right? And I made a point yesterday that sometimes depending on, on, on what you're doing, you look for a model that, that, that will represent the behavior of it. And once you're satisfied with the model now, then we could go ahead and, 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 and work with the model now to design. Because if I try to um, model the, the, the mechanical aspects, how does that help us? I think mechanical means um, things like springiness, um, tension, torsion, those, those, those sort of things that they would have met in physics. Luckily for us, the, 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 the suspension, the mass, the torsion, produces an electrical effect. So if we can measure the electrical effect and model the electrical effect, then we have an equivalent behavior for it. If it behaves in a particular way, we have an electrical equivalent, and that is our model. Yeah? It takes time to come up with the models, of, of course, a lot of experimentation and, and so on. But like us, this somebody or some people did their work on the quartz um, piezoelectric behavior. And, and saw that the best model that fit that behavior was a model that had an RLC circuit, a series RLC circuit in parallel with a, a capacitance, right? And if you were to plot the, the reactance of this, in other words, if I were to put a signal of voltage in here and start varying the frequency, what you're going to observe is that as the frequency goes up, the impedance of this network drops, and at some point it drops fairly close to zero. And then at that point in time, that is when at that frequency, you find that the inductive and the capacitive um, series re uh, reactances, their behaviors cancel. Right, remember they're, they're not only reactances, but they have phase angles with them. So one cancels the other one. And this, they, 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 at the particular frequency, this capacitor has a much lower impedance and the resistor, so this, so this circuit basically behaves like it's just a resistor. And the impedance drops to a minimum. As you start to get the, crank the, the frequency up a little bit now, then the capacitances start to come back into effect again. So the capacitances and the, the resonance behavior of the, the circuit here and this parallel one start to interact again and then the, 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 the resonance at some particular frequency, you now the impedance gets back up to our peak. And then as you go now, higher up again, this capacitance here starts to short circuit everybody you now and the impedance drops again. So you have this sort of up-down behavior of, of, of the, the crystal. One is the series resonance when the, the, the series inductance and the capacitance cancel each other. And then the other one, 
what we call the parallel resonance when the impedances of both branches of the the, 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 um, the little the parallel circuit balance out each other now they reach at a maximum they are identical and the impedance value is peaked and then this one starts to get less and less and it goes back down fair enough make sense lots of scratching on the dial but everyone following so far right one of the things you have to remember with with with, with, with um with circuits is that capacitive circuits capacitances are essentially open circuits to low frequencies and short circuits to high so at low frequencies you can say oh, at low frequencies this is out of the the circuit if this one if this one is if um the values and you'll see what the values are both of them at low frequencies will have fairly high impedances but if this one is 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 is, is a smaller capacitance then this one is out of the circuit before so the circuit at low frequencies basically involves this branch at the higher frequencies this capacitance now starts to conduct more and this one now becomes a dominant one so at low frequencies the the, the green branch well i'll just do it over and where the green branch uh is a dominant and at some particular frequency at that in that branch now ls and cs going to cancel in terms of the impedance value because one the p the phase angles of, of each of them are opposite one is plus 90 one is minus 90. And that gives you this minimal. And then when the frequency cranks up now, everybody starts to get into the act. There's a peak again, and then C, um, P starts to take over and then the resistance drops again. That's intuitively, just understanding what happens in there and you could work it out mathematically. So the parallel resonance is a couple of kilohertz higher. So the first frequency that you get is a series resonance. And the, 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 um, the next frequency that you get from the crystal is its parallel capacitance, parallel resonance, sorry. You see that spec, if you pull up the, 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 the data sheet on a crystal, you get both resonances being given to you. So you can work with a, whichever one you want to design for. All right. So since it comprises um, two, Two parameters, the, 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 the um, parallel inductance and the parallel um, capacitance, this one and this one, are set by the mechanical properties of the crystal. In other words, how they slice the crystal from the original quartz crystal and they grow the quartz crystal, just like how you make glass by melting quartz and um, by the raw silicon dioxide and so on. From that, they're able to once they melt the, 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 the sand, basically, they're able to extract the, the, the quartz crystal um, from it. And this now, the, the, the CP, largely has to do with the electrodes, the, the, those wires that we attach to the, the, um, the crystal. And then the damping, we came across damping already. Remember the, the quartz crystal is a little wafer and it's going to vibrate. And it doesn't vibrate forever. If you remove the, 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 the whatever is driving it, that vibration is going to die out, which is what we call the damping of it, all right? And it's usually very small. In fact, for a typical a four megahertz crystal, these are the sort of values that you have inside of here. That the, the series resistance RS is just about 100 ohms. The inductance is 100 millihenries. The capacitance, the series capacitance is 0 0.015 picofarad, which is very, very small, right? And then the parallel capacitance is, is significantly bigger, which is 25 picofarads. Well, compared to that, they are still, still very small, right? Um, remember, pico is 10 to the minus 12. So these are very, very small um, devices. And then the Q is high. And remember what we said Q was. If you have some Q is a measure of how high the resonance, how high it jumps from, from outside of resonance to the 
width of the actual frequency. So something like this that has a Q of 25,000 means that as you go, as it approaches the resonant frequency, the, the output is going to be nothing, but then right at the resonant frequency, you're going to get the amplitude of the signal jumping, well, that's badly drawn, but jumping very high up uh, rapidly. And then outside of the frequency of interest is going to die back down quickly as well. And we have two of those, right? A series one and a parallel um, frequency. For this particular thing, a four megahertz crystal, this was the parallel resonant frequency for it. And if you go just like we've done with transistors and, and, and diodes and the like, you go and you check the spreadsheets. If you go to any of the, the suppliers and you look for four megahertz crystal for argument's sake, you're going to see a, a number of them coming up. And if you click on a data sheet, you're going to get the table that will tell you all of this information here. They give you that because presumably you're going to work with the crystal to, to, to make something um, useful an oscillator of some sort, right? And we go on, um, and of course the, the, the algebra getting the behavior of this is very simple. This is a series RLC circuit. So it's one over SC plus R plus one over plus, plus um, SL. And it's parallel with our capacitor, which is a one over SC again. We said RS is small, so you could take RS out of the um, out of the equation, and if you take that out, let, if it is small relative to the the other components inside of here, RS comes out, and the the impedance of the crystal simply boils down to a function that is a function of just a series and parallel capacitances. So when you get that in there, and of course now, then you make the substitution J omega, and you're going to get this coming up. Make sense? Yeah, it's not complex. I'm not doing any integration. All I'm doing here is just straight, simple circuit theory and some simple um, simplification. Yeah, make sense? Yeah, the, right, the, the, the expression just looks long and then we do the same thing again. So if you look at this now, right, you just add up the impedance, exactly. And if you look at this now, you realize that the, the crystal, if you just examine this here, get a different color. If you look at this here, you notice that we have two set of complex equations inside of here. We have J on top and we have J below. So we can, I mean, we could group it like we have before, but each of those now means that at some point in time, we can get a value of, of omega that makes the crystal um, impedance zero. Remember, and that's the first one here. Remember, there's a, there's a frequency that makes the impedance fairly close to zero. And then inside of here, there's a frequency value inside of here that is going to make um, Z crystal, the impedance of the crystal, very high. And you can see it straight here. If you substitute, when you substitute S equal to J omega and you simplify it now, the one that makes the crystal zero, the impedance of the crystal zero is whatever is the frequency that makes the numerator zero. All right, in other words, for want of a better word, is the, the zeros of that particular transfer function. So if you work all that here, you will get a value for omega in terms of LS and CS. So notice that the, the, the series resonant frequency, which is what we said, right? So the series resonant frequency, right, will be LSCS. So the series resonant frequency is a function of, of CS and 
um, LS. It doesn't involve RS because RLS is relatively small. And then the one that makes the, the impedance um, very high is the frequency that makes this number um, zero. All right, if, if the um, denominator goes to zero, then the frequency, sorry, the impedance Z crystal goes high. And that is your parallel resonant frequency. And I will give you another one in terms of, notice that one will involve CS and CP. That's a little more complex, right? So you have CS there, you're going to, so you're going to have, um, just from there, it look, you're going to have um, CS plus CP over CP, CS, CL, and you take the square root of, of that whole thing, right? So simple algebra, right? And, and, and well, here you have it on the two slides, so the series resonant and the parallel resonant. You as an engineer, you can actually pick whichever one you want, right? So some, some designers will, will um, it, it just depends on the particular application that they're in, and um, they, they, they will choose which is the, 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 the crystal, which is the, the frequency you particularly want to work with. That is your choice as, a, as an engineer, right? And it is solely determined by the, um, the, 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 the crystal parameters which are well defined. Okay, so the series resonant, which is the top one here, this is determined solely by the crystal itself. So it is a very stable, once somebody makes a, a crystal and they cut the crystal and mounts it, the LS and CS parameters are very no, very stable. Uh, so so that once you um, make an oscillator using that, you're going to get a very stable frequency. It's not going to vary all over the place. And just, just imagine that or compare that with the, um, the LC oscillators that we, um, sorry, not the LC, the RC oscillators that we did before. Resistances have a tolerance of about well, five, ten percent, depending on the kind of resistances that you use. You could probably capacitances have, um, you know, um, in the order of ten to twenty percent. So when you design and you get the components and you put it in, typically the frequency that you get is going to be maybe a five, ten percent off from what you calculated it to be. Here, once you buy the crystal and you select the, 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 the parameters according, LS and CS are not going to vary, right? So if, if somebody tells you this is a 12 megahertz crystal, um, that the series resonant frequency is 12 megahertz, then they design it and they cut it that way. You're going to get 12 megahertz, plus or minus maybe a 0.1% kind of thing. So it's extremely stable, all right? The, Parallel one is a little less so because the parallel one depends on the, the, the contact, um, an electrical contact between the quartz crystal and the, um, and the, 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 the external wool. So you pay a price for that. If you buy a cheap crystal like the ones that they, they, they use in the piezoelectric tweeters and so on, those are not going to give you particularly good oscillations because the, 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 the contact wire um, connection is not a particularly good one. But if you buy the, the, the high quality ones that we use for electronics and microprocessor work and so on, then again, you're going to get a very nice, highly predictable um, oscillation behavior, yeah? And of course, if you want to make that work, you put it practically, you need to buffer it because the crystal by itself can't take any load. All right, you, you, you put the, 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 where am I? You put, you put this crystal now and you connect, you connect this to a circuit. If you connect here and here to circuit elements, remember you're, you, you, you're in the megahertz range typically. So every bit of wire, and if you put this on a breadboard, it wouldn't work because the breadboard, the solderless breadboards that we use, the capacitances between the traces are of the same order of magnitude uh, as, as the capacitances here that we're dealing with. So once you put it into a circuit, like just as it is out, out, out of the case mounted, it's not going to work. So typically what you have to do is to put some protection around it. This is something like an op-amp. 
This, of course, is a symbol for a crystal. Right, it's showing a block, the, the, the rectangle rec represents a crystal, and the two plates on the other side, of course, they, 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 contact, um, they, they contact electrodes. All right, and you put it into an amplifier circuit. So here with an op-amp, the op-amp, of course, is buffering because this current here that the op-amp takes is zero for, more, for, for all intents and purposes. So what we do here, um, you might be able to, to op-amp at low frequencies, but in any case, um, for a breadboard, the, the upper limit for this sort of less breadboard is about one megahertz, right? So like later on, when you're dealing with your microprocessor classes, the microprocessor and the clock are on a separate printed circuit board. So you will connect to that separate printed circuit board with jumper wires and, 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 and connectors of this sort, but you're not going to put that oscillator and microprocessor and plant it on the board. It's not going to work. It's not going to give you that the, the high frequency range. When you're talking about anything above one megahertz, and in fact, the sort of less breadboard um, I would limit my upper frequency to about 100, to about 500k. All right, just as a just as a practical thing. So it doesn't work. It's really a low frequency um, modeling platform. From the time you start to go up a little bit higher, then trace capacitances and wiring capacitances and and everything else you could think of in terms of capacitance and inductance behavior now starts to interfere. And that actually cause, causes a lot of headache. I've tried to, to make circuits and, and kind of forgetting the, the, the upper limit of the, the breadboard. And the circuit design is working well. You put it on the breadboard and it doesn't work and you're scratching your head, right? It works on paper, it works in simulation. You double check, you triple check, you, you, you take off all the wiring and you, um, you, you reconnect everybody and the circuit doesn't work. And then kind of realize, wait a minute, if the frequency here that is why it is the, the frequency is too high, right? So um, there's a limit and always like with everything engineering, there is a limit to how these things work. So you put it into an op-amp circuit and it's buffering and they, they, so the they actual, the crystal network part here is R1 and um, the, the, the Z here. And the amplifier now gives you again the R2, R3 bit here gives you the gain, right? So you have a non-inverting amplifier and you, you, you put that, right? Just now, um, Stephen, I'll, I'll, I'll think that. And um, here you have a practical sort of, you power it up and, 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 and you... What they typically do, of course, and this is why I was showing you this picture before, right? Once it loads up, this. So that particular one, and you're going to meet those kind of canisters. Inside of here is the crystal and op arm circuit and some other and the other little components required, shielded in a printed circuit board, and they give you the power pins and they give you the frequency output. But you have that circuit now is buffered, is protected. And you have um, you have no direct access to the crystal. It's well taken care of by the op amp circuit, and of course the op amp is not going to be um, a simple like a 741 op amp. It's going to be a much um, higher frequency device. And just one other comment: typical frequency, the signal coming out of that um, for the crystal is usually not a um, a, a, a perfect sinusoid because of the very high frequencies especially when you go up to like um 20 megahertz and above you will get something looking like a a, a very sharp sawtooth sort of behavior right with curves is going to give you a kind of thing looking like that the microprocessors don't care about that what they what they care about is is the edges right so they're using the edges so once you could get that sort of behavior coming from the oscillator um that is enough for a clock circuit for, for the microprocessors to work. But it's extremely stable. It doesn't um, vary with component values and the like. Right, so um, Stephen, you had a question here. Um, so below 500 kilohertz, the break are not, right. Most, right, so, so, so for most typical sort of applications, they inter, 
um, what, what shall I say, the interconnection capacitances for the breadboard wouldn't affect uh, the circuit too much. All right. Um, you need to what, of course, they, 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 all sorts of things affect that. Um, if you have been using the breadboard for a while, and for instance, when you, when you stick the resistors or wires into it, you puncture the back of the breadboard. The breadboard is mounted on a, on a metal platform. And there's, a, there's an insulator between the actual breadboard and the metal base. Sometimes over a long period of time, um, the resistor leads or capacitor leads or wire leads um, sometimes puncture that insulating layer. And then when you put a, a device on, it's actually in contact with a metal base of, of the, um, the breadboard, in which case you, you have an issue, you, you could be shorting out something. Um, the capacitance is generally, yeah, below 500K, you, you could operate with a certain um, degree of confidence and um, for most designs. But once you start to crank up above that, then you have no choice. You simulate and then you have to make a printed circuit board to, 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 to get it to work. And as I said, most of the sort of microprocessor labs, the devices that we have, like the PICs or the Arduinos or the, um, the, 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 um, the Pies, the Raspberry Pies, are all on printed circuit boards with the, the, the crystal oscillator, the clock circuit um, on already mounted. So you have no access to, to that part, but the connections that they come through a port and those connections, you, you can connect to your breadboard, but again, you have to be careful what sort of wise yeah? So make some sort of sense? Everyone following? Yeah? The thing is, is that um, practically speaking, there are all sorts of things that they're going to encounter. I can't tell you, um, everything that you're going to meet and and, and uh, dr radix made a, a, a little comment yesterday and it was something i mentioned to you that, that they try to keep this this smoke in this circuit remember very early on i told you that half the fun in in, in electronics too is, is is to sort of put things together um i don't know i are you all hearing me or, or am i um cutting in or not Okay, it, it, it may be your Wi-Fi, it may, may be your Wi-Fi connection then, okay? Yeah, it's it's a little, um, yeah, we're a little wonky today. I don't know what the weather is like in certain places, right? Um, okay. Yeah, so, 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 um, where am I? Right, in and out and understandable. Yeah, so, um, well, hopefully what is recording, because it's recording straight from my mic here, hopefully should be, um, in playback should be fairly all right. Okay, yeah, so so as I said, um, when, you, when you're designing sort of half the fun in electronics too is, 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 is to, to, to blow some components and, and, or to get burnt or to smell some smoke from somewhere, right? But you really want to minimize that. And, and what I'm telling you is just some little things to if you're making circuits like in, in in your final year project or you like electronics and you like to build things or later on you, you you're doing things for actual um design you you're somewhere and you're trying to solve a problem and so on just remember that things like breadboards have limitations even simulation software has limitations they they assume certain things in the, in in the simulation so you have to take it um you have to know what the limits are. And I always mention that to you as engineers, when you're doing anything, ask yourself, what are the sort of range of um, the parameters I'm expecting this thing to work with? So that you know, if you get something that is outside of that range, that you stop and think a little bit, you switch it off and you say, okay, wait a minute, something is right here. Am I at fault or is the circuit at fault? And if you think along those lines and you keep your head on, it saves you a lot of headache, um, headaches later on. We all get into the habit of something not working and you're trying to fix it um, 
on the fly while it's there and it's not working you're, you're trying to change things and do things that isn't the best approach sometimes when you're panicking you 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 will end up but you have to stop and think okay right so the sort of last topic to close off the whole discussion on oscillators now have to do with amplitude Remember, we said that the gain, the, 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 um, the loop gain has to be one. And uh, we said that practically, um, and again, because you're dealing with components that vary, that, that vary, that have tolerances, that if you set the gain at exactly one, things vary. And what will happen is, is, is one of two things, the oscillator input the oscillator output will die out. Or if we make it safe and we go a little bit above one, then the output of the oscillator is going to increase until it saturates the, the, the well, in our cases, we're using our amps as the buffers, is going to saturate the amplifiers, right? So they're going to go up and they're going to start oscillating, basically switching between positive and negative V saturation. So for instance, for a sinusoid, you're going to see that the output going to progressively and slowly change from a sinusoidal waveform to a square wave, right? Because the top of the, um, as the loop gain gets bigger and bigger, right? When you have the sine wave, as it gets bigger, it's going to start, as this increases and it reaches the, the, the VCC limit, this is going to increase and at VCC, it's going to, it can't go anything more. So it's going to go like that, then go down. So all this part on here is sinusoid, and then it flattens because it reaches, it can't go above that. It can't do that. And then as it keeps increasing more and more, this now slowly starts to get to that. And at that point, well, you have a very good, a stable multivibrator working, but it's no longer sinusoidal, right? If that is what you want, fine. You just, you just made an <laughs> an unstable multivibrator the hard way okay so what you need now is some form of um way to, to, to if the gain goes up above one you back it off a little bit so you're trying to keep it as close to one as possible if it gets too low then it's going to die out so what you want is something that will make the gain change above and below one every so often Am I hearing you? Are you hearing me? Sorry, I think I just I saw a little low signal come out. Did I fade out there? Okay, good. So let me try and conclude this before we have some extremely dark skies up by me, and I'm not too sure how long the, the connection may hold. Right, so this is what, if we make the basic um, wine bridge oscillator that we did before, um, I think I spelled wine wrong there, but anyway, this is what's going to happen. The yeah, you have some, some systems moving away. And being electrical engineers, we should like thunder and lightning, but it, it affects us occasionally. <laughs> so this is what happens to the Weinberg oscillator that, that we spoke about um, um, last week. It will start oscillating once you turn it on. And then the envelope, if you look at the, the, the output envelope, it's going to go up and up and up and then eventually reach the upper amp um saturation voltage and at that point it clips and it, it doesn't go anywhere further the output clips now and it slowly starts to get distorted from a sinusoid to um a square wave so some simple one one um there are three ways of doing it one is to use some heat sensitive resistors in the circuit and what it does is that as the amplitude increases, the current flow in the, um, the network, wherever you put it, the current through the resistor increases. Um, there's an I squared R heating effect. Yeah, I mean, are, you, are you talking about small, small wattages here? Because this is, is milliampere you're dealing with. So milliampere through the particular device causes the resistance to change. If the resistance changes, we can use that in the gain network, the amplifier network, to adjust the gain. And there are two types of, of, of devices. Um, there's a device where the resistance increases as the temperature increases. 
um, and, and they sort of generally call them Sen Sisters, right? Um, unusual name, but but there you have it. And then one that you're probably more in, uh, familiar with, one called a Firmister, right? Which the, the resistance decreases as the temperature, um, as the current flow goes through it and the temperature rises, its resistance decreases. So if you were to put it into the Weinberg oscillator, right? These are two circuits that show you very simply what you do is that in the feedback network for the amplifier. This is the Weinberg network here, so you're not affecting that. That's the, 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 the series parallel um, circuit. In the upper network now, if you take the, you remember you have the feedback and the, the go on resistor for the, the, the gain part. If you take the feedback resistor and you replace it with a thermistor, then what happens as the gain of the, um, you know, the thermistor does as it heats, the, the, the resistance goes down. So as the amplitude here goes up, the current flow through the resistor increases slightly. The thermistor warms up. And because of the feedback over the ground resistor, as this heats up and the, and the gain, the, the resistance value drops, then the gain of the amplifier drops a little bit and tries to get the try. So as it goes above one, the amplitude goes up. It heats the thermistor. Uh, this particular thermistor is a, is a standard one, which is an R53. It's not resistor number 53 inside of here. It looks kind of funny, but it's an R53 thermistor. So as it warms up, its resistor de resistance decreases so that the gain of the circuit drops, amplitude stabilizes again. The other way is a cheap, really a very um, novel and cheap way, which is that you replace a gun resistor with a little lamp. The lamp is a little, um, now, now you're all very young, so you probably don't know about things like um, little torch lights that had a, had a bulb in them. You all are accustomed to LED torch lights, no, right? LED little, um, and you're accustomed. In fact, you don't even have to use your, uh, your, your, your cell phone as a light, right? But go back, <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking of, um, I'm making a joke here, but um, yeah, yeah, you love LEDs, that's fine. But there are torch lights that actually have a little bulb, a little lamp bulb, and what you're talking about here, are those that work with like a little 1.5 um, volt battery. So a little incandescent lamp bulb that works with 1.5 volts and you put it now in the gun resistor. Now these work the other way wrong. As, they, 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 as the lamp heats up with the current flow through it, it would mean of current and make it light, but as they, 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 the current flows through it, the resistance is going to go up. All right, so the resistance goes up, the gain goes down. So that one works the other way. So the output goes up, for instance, the current flows through here, the lamp warms up, so its resistance increases. The gain, because we're using it in the gun resistance, um, as a gun resistance in the, in the gain loop, it's going to cause the gain of the amplifier to drop, so it comes back down. So very cheap. This one, is a couple of dollars for our 53. This one is a couple of cents, okay? Um, but you have to get a, um, a good old fashioned 1.5 volt um, lamp, which are very scarce uh, these days. All right, the other way, no, this is a little more complex and the, and the, the, the description is, is very straightforward. Here we have um neon bulbs um i'm um, not neon needs a higher voltage to, to stabilize you remember the, the neon bulb is um is a is a discharge bulb that's why you use it on ac systems right you i, I doubt you'll be able to get a neon bulb to um to, to work on as lower voltage as this they're designed to work with with, with um like 110 ac on, on the so what we have here if you look at, we have a little, um, we have a little block here, right? So the block is sampling the output, and these little components here, the two diodes. Notice how they're connected: the capacitor and the ground resistor. This basically gives a negative voltage. 
So as the output of the amplifier of the oscillator, so we have a, a sinusoidal thing and it's going to, let's say, plus 10, plus 10 minus 10 volts. This here now, this circuit takes some of that and produces a little minus negative voltage out of that. So it rectifies, this is a little half wave rectifier here, filter capacitor and a load resistor. So it's generating a minus VDC here on the gate of the, um, the, the JFET. So what you're doing here now is that you're operating the JFET. And if you remember from, from um, um, your, your discussions are that in level one, over a limited range of, bias, of biasing, the JFET actually looks like a plane resistance, right, between the drain and the source. So if you bias it properly, that, uh, that, that, that JFET here, it is not designated here, but this device here is a little voltage control resistor. And all the circuit is doing, and, and, and this is what I will expect you to understand, not to calculate the, the, the values, but for the purposes of understanding, what will happen is that as the amplitude of the output signal increases, VDC gets a little more negative. Once VDC will get more negative, it decreases the bias of the JFET and causes the resistance to go up. So if the resistance goes up, notice it's in the gong loop, so it's going to drop the gain of the amplifier. If this drops too much, then VDC is going to get less negative. So the, the, the JFET is going to, to, to turn on a little bit more, right? The resistance is going to drop and therefore the gain of the amplifier is going to increase. Yeah, make sense? So it uses some of what we spoke about before, a half wave rectifier, a filter, and a, and a, a little load resistor. So this one is using a little, a little miniature power supply, a little minus a negative voltage power supply to generate a, a control voltage for a JFET. And then one other very practical approach is to use this. You take the wine bridge and you put two back-to-back -back Zener diodes. Now notice how the Zener diodes are connected here. They are across the, the, the gain, they are across the, 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 the feedback resistor for the op amp, one of the gain setting resistors for the op amp. So let's say each of these are three volt zeners. Whatever the voltage is here, seven above that when the zener is forward bias, right? 0.7 to about one volt depending on the zener. Once here now goes past the breakdown voltage of that particular zener, which is three volts, this one starts to conduct. So basically what we're doing now is that once the Zener voltage here gets past the breakdown voltage of this one here being positive and here negative, then this um, conducts and starts to bypass the resistor. So if it bypasses the resistor now, the gain of the circuit drops. Yeah? The other way now is that if here, when here goes negative, then eventually at some point in time, here is more positive than, than that point. This diode will now conduct and the same thing happens. Once this one starts to conduct, it bypasses the resistor again. So in either case, once the voltage gets a little above three volts positive or negative, if, they, if these are three volt Zener diodes, both of them are going to conduct one in the in the avalanche, the breakdown zone as a normal zener, the other one as a conventional diode that is forward bias, and partially bypass the, the that this resistor, uh, the feedback resistor here. So once it partially bypasses that, the gain of the circuit drops. And once the gain of the circuit drops, it stabilizes. And in fact, this the, 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 the more common ways of doing um, the, the, the stabilization for the amplitude of, of the um, of the Weinberg oscillator and indeed of the 
the, the other ones, the, the phase shift oscillators as well. Uh, when you do that, in fact, that particular circuit, when you simulate it, you see you're getting a very nice um, output um, voltage here. Yeah, it's very stable, right? In that case, I think there, there were two volt zeners um, that I used for the simulation. So notice that the, the output is capped at a little over, um, it's somewhere between um, like plus or minus about five volts, which is it, um, which would be the, at least three volts Zena. So it should be the three volts plus for the Zena plus the one volt for the forward bias. So it's about about four volts up and down kind of thing. Yeah, it's starting to rain very hard here. So it may be hearing some background noise. But you understand how it operates? Make sense? Yeah, no, maybe. Yeah. Maybe leaning towards the, yeah, yes, right. You have to understand, the, the trick of it is to understand how that little arrangement works. This actually, it, it looks a, a bit unusual, but it actually conducts in both directions deep once you exceed the Zener diode voltage, right? It's a nice, um, it's a, what, what they call a voltage clamp. C L A M P, a voltage clamp, right? And you will see it. So it's an application of Zener diodes, and you're clamping the voltage. It cannot go above plus or minus V Z plus the, the the sort of forward bias voltage of the diode. Yeah. Exactly. Right, so it limits the output amplitude and it doesn't limit it by clipping it. Right, so it's not going to, the, the output amplitude is not going to go here when it reaches Zener diode, it cuts it off. What we're using here is that the Zener diode, as it starts to, 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 to um, conduct, it bypasses the, 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 um, that gain resistor there. Remember, it's conducting, so it has an RZ in it. So slowly as it conducts, Rz becomes in parallel with R3 and the gain of the, the, the amplifier drops, right? So as this thing starts to approach saturation, we drop the gain a little bit. So you're adjusting the gain all the time. Remember the gain, but in the case of the Weinbridge network, the gain of the amplifier is supposed to be three. Somebody pointed out that very early on in the class. So as this gain goes a little above three, um, then the, 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 the Zener diodes kick in and bring it back um, to three, okay? And so the overall loop gain becomes one, which is what we wanted anyway. Yeah? So any questions? I'm sure you have, right? But you have to think about it and, 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 and um, sort of, um, what, do you, what, what do you call it? Digest it a little bit. Look at what, what we what, what we're doing here. Um, all of the material is in the, the handout, they, they, they read out. So there's material to read inside of there. As I said, there are a couple of typographical errors. Um, so when you're reviewing, I would suggest at least the topics that we covered, you read the, the, the sort of description in the, the handout and then look at the slides, um, maybe in conjunction again with the recordings so they could use the slides now as sort of point form notes now to your revision. And, and if at any point in time things aren't making clear or what I'm saying here contradicts something that, that you're seeing elsewhere, let me know, okay? I need to make sure too that I, I haven't explained things in an incorrect form for you. All right? Okay, so that concludes our discussion on oscillators. Right, so so we did quite a bit. We've actually done quite a bit for the for the semester so far. I am going to put up solutions for the, the, the problem set so we could talk about that and some other little um questions for you to do as, as tutorial type questions on, on, on the like. And I'm finalizing the midterm, which will be next week. Um is it next week, I said? Next week or, 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 or Tuesday, right? Yeah, next week Tuesday, right. The signals is if they're following Tuesday. So next week, Tuesday. All right, so I'm working on that and I'll um, and, and see we see what happens. Well, Jordan, you better check it. Eh? I, I wouldn't want you to turn up and, and, and then it's on the wrong day. 
Um, okay, so let me end the recording.